City of Stevens Point Common Council Meeting, recorded January 15, 2024. I have 7 o'clock. We'll call the regular council meeting to order. Clerk, could you please call the roll? Christensen? Here. Shore? Here. Keemer? Here. Broderick? Here. Burr? Here. Plassans? Here. Kneebone? Here. Shuda? Here. Lang? Here. Fischler? Here. Morrow? Here. And all are present. Uh, please stand for our salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm going to do something that's not unprecedented, but I'm deferring my mayor's opening remarks to Manuela. Manuela is a foreign exchange student from Brazil, attending Pacelli High School, and for the last two weeks, she has been in the mayor's office working on a project that is taking all of our utility bills for all of our buildings and tracking the energy usage for both electric and gas going back all the way to 2015. This is actually going to help us going forward as we measure our improvements. We know that we make changes and that there is an improvement, but we haven't really been able to put a solid number on how well we're doing. Um, and the idea was actually brought forth a couple of times, but Maxwell Johnson most recently uh, talked about getting a group together to do this. Rather than a group, Manuela has taken two weeks and done it on her own. So over the, the next month or so, we're going to be compiling that and making sure everybody has an understanding of where we've been with our energy consumption, trying to mark some highlights with some of the things that we know we've done so we can measure when we put the green hinges on fire station one and two, for example, and we can see what the difference was. Um, going forward, we're going to have a, a group that is going to be charged with kind of giving us ideas for sustainability initiatives. And in the next month or two, I'd like the council to reaffirm our commitment to reducing our carbon footprint in that regard. Um, so Manuela, I'd like to have you come to the lectern, tell, a little bit, tell us a little bit about what you've done. Uh, I'd really like to hear some of the differences between Brazil and Wisconsin, especially since it's probably the coldest it's ever been. And then talk about the, the bread, and uh, we've got, we don't have, may not have enough for everybody, but at least the, the council and directors can sample it. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank the mayor for this opportunity. I think working as an intern at the mayor's office was really important for me, not only for my future, um, for working, you know, at an office and and, and professional environment, so as an opportunity of learning, but also I could do something that really helped the city. So I really hope that this works. Well, it worked already, <laughs> and thank you for everyone that helped me, and I'm really glad even though I'm not here from the United States, I'm not here from Wisconsin or Stevens Point, I still got to help the city and, well, make a difference. And, well, when, when I was meeting the mayor, we were talking and I told him about a really traditional dish we have in Brazil. It's called pão de queijo, which is a bread made out of cheese. And, well, it's really traditional and it's really good. And mayor's wife, she, she baked it for us. So if you want to try it. And yeah, thank you again for the opportunity. <laughs> so you mentioned that you come from a small town in Brazil. How many people? Yes. So I come from a, a small town. It's 700,000 people. <laughs> um, <laughs> comparing to the capital of my state, which is Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo City, it has 11 million people. So I think, you know, the size is kind of relative. <laughs> but yeah, I've been really enjoying uh, living here in Stevens Point and, and seeing how a small city works, especially in the United States, which is totally different. It's a different different country. And well, life, the lifestyle here is just different. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Thank um, you. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's pretty interesting because this is probably the coldest weather you've ever been in, right? Mm -hmm. I'm freezing him. <laughs> so are we. Yeah, I was really excited for the snow, 
I got like two days of snow and now I'm done. But <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and you know, we're we're really proud to have Manuela as part of our community uh, through rest the rest of the school year. We've talked about it, and uh, she's going to be meeting with members of the university because this would probably be a great opportunity to come back to school here and go to UWSP and uh, maybe start our first. Uh, Wisconsin, Brazil, sister city. All right, there you go. <laughs> so we'll pass these around. Feel free to help yourself. They're made with tapioca flour, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of unique. So thank you very much, Manuela, for the project and for sharing some of your culture with us over the last couple of weeks. Next, we will move on to item number three. Persons who wish to address the mayor and council for up to three minutes on a non-agenda item should register their request at this time. Uh, those, do we have a public hearing? Any public hearings, you're not required to um, register in advance, but it doesn't look like we have any public hearings on our agenda this evening. So anybody who wants to speak on an agenda item, have you registered? Okay, you wanna bring those up, Bethany, and then we'll move right into that. Item number four, persons who wish to address the mayor and council for up to three minutes on a non-agenda item. Uh, Alder person Kneebone, you get the floor first. Thank you. Actually, driving in tonight, um, I noticed that the park department is laying the water down over at Gerke Park for the ice rink and the hockey rink, and driving in on roads that have been plowed and cleared. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of our wonderful city staff, first responders, everything you all do for all of us in this city is amazing. So thank you and happy new year. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Gifford, Bob Gifford, you're up. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alder Christensen, if you could, they'll last as far as they last and I apologize if you don't get one. <laughs> they might get all the way. <laughs> they are good. <laughs> The recipe's up here and I can make that available for anyone if you want it to. Mr. Gifford, go ahead. Okay, I think I can hold it to three minutes here. Uh, I'm we here got for, a timer for you. I'm here <laughs> for my few minutes uh, just to introduce some more ideas in the mix on the problem of the affordable housing shortage here and in most cities in our state. Um, we know that here there are a number of different programs and solutions offered in our community, right? You have mutual aid groups like One Big Tent. Um, you have the homeless warm, warming shelter that Tiffany has run for years. Um, and then there's nonprofits like CAP Services on uh, whose board I serve, who have been providing low-income housing for decades too. Uh, and they're trying to expand with the concept of what they call a land conservancy trust, where the land is never traded on the market. In other words, it remains in trust. And then there's the Rent Ready Program, which helps people with poor rental history <laughs> to rent again. Um, but for going further, what I think is needed in our communities, um, both small cities and big ones, is the whole system approach, right? Uh, at the Wisconsin Counties Association, I got to hear our director Ruth Schmidt of Wisconsin Early Childhood Association, who oddly enough <laughs> rattled off a number of systems in our state that she calls broken business models or failed markets, uh, starting with the childcare system, <clears throat> of course, for her. But she, sent, she then said, uh, housing and transportation here are also broken business models, and I can instantly, there's an idea I can use, you know, and so I'm doing that. Um, housing is definitely a broken business model, a failed system, and it fails six different demographic groups of low-income people that I have identified who lack the power to make needed change. So they have to rely on uh, people in political office to do so. Uh, so in the months ahead, I'm gonna be putting together with anybody that's interested, uh, what I'm calling an affordable housing legislative action coalition. And the idea is to bring both elected officials, that's y'all, at the county and city levels, although I don't expect a lot of action out of county. Uh, at the counties association, I don't see much going on with housing. But the municipalities definitely. 
And the idea is to apply big pressure on our state legislature. That's why it's called legislative action, right? To enact a comprehensive program for social housing in all 72 Wisconsin house counties. I use the word social housing because public housing has such a stigma attached to it. I'm almost gonna wrap it up, okay. To then to fund this program with very large ongoing appropriations that can be then be directed by Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development to collaborative efforts of city plus county in all areas that want them, okay. There'll be multifamily units, of course, but the design build process must focus on state of the art energy conserving, including energy production incorporated in building with solar hot water, PV, uh, solar, and so forth. And I think once we get started on this, we can start to make a real dent in the affordable housing shortage. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gifford. Um, that exhausts our non-agenda speaker list. Item number five is a presentation uh, from our city zoning administrator, Adam Kuhn, in regards to safe streets and roads for all, a, a grant that the county recently received. And where'd Adam go? Adam, I know you're in the other room. Dude, I don't want to be in the meeting. I don't cancel that. Uh, share screen. Share PowerPoint, okay, and you're on. All right, uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, as the mayor just mentioned, uh, wanted to talk with you a little bit about uh, the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant program that the county was awarded. Reason I wanna have a conversation with you all is that the city is was a co-applicant as part of that grant application. So I wanna give you a, a little rundown as it relates to the program itself and then talk about some next steps over the next two, two and a half years or so. So first slide you see just overview of the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant program. It's administered by the US Department of Transportation and the overall goal of this uh, grant program is to try to prevent roadway deaths and serious injuries. Next slide. For uh, this grant application, there's two opportunities that a municipality could leverage for. Uh, first being to obtain planning grants to create essentially a comprehensive plan to try to address uh, ways that we can improve traffic safety uh, here within the city and a broader region. The other would be infrastructure dollars as well. We didn't qualify as a city nor as a county, so we went towards the planning grant option. So this was a collaborative effort between Porch County, the city, and the villages of Plover, Whitey, and Park Ridge, uh, where we asked for approximately $200,000 in federal funds to uh, really seek three final deliverables. The first one being to create a comprehensive safety action plan, the second being to update the 2014 countywide bike ped plan, and then the third being to perform demonstration activities to support the planning process for those two aforementioned plans. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of those three, each of those three deliverables in a little bit. Uh, so on the next slide, um, so that grant application was submitted mid-July of 2023. About a month ago, mid-December, we found out that Porch County was one of about a dozen or so uh, communities and tribal nations here in the state who were awarded planning funds, uh, planning grant funds from the U.S. Department of Transportation for the 2023 application cycle. So really great opportunity. It's not so off. It's not very often that we receive federal funds, especially from the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation, so it's a great opportunity that we have in the next, again, two, two and a half years. So next slide, uh, I want to talk again about each of the three final deliverables, the first one being the Comprehensive Safety Action Plan. So this is going to be an action plan that's going to focus more so on vehicular modes of transportation and less so on bicycle, pedestrian, more of the multimodal forms of transportation. So the crux of a safety action plan, what does it entail? It's meant to identify intersections and street segments that have a higher probability of crashes uh, that occur. Based off of data that we receive from our law enforcement agencies here in the city, uh, county, and village of Plover in this instance. Uh, so the image on the bottom right hand of uh, bottom right hand side of the screen shows just did a quick query of uh, crashes involving injuries or fatalities here in the city over the last 12 months. You can see there's a, a pretty significant amount of uh, uh, blue dots, uh, yellow dots, etc. 
So once those locations are identified, it's going to be the responsibility of this soon-to-be-determined outside consultant to uh, spell out specific rec uh, recommendations as to how to make these intersections, these street segments, more safe. These could be in the form of specific street uh, improvements, more infrastructure concrete-based improvements. These could be policy procedural recommendations from an administrative level. Uh, they could be enforcement strategies as well. Uh, next slide. So the second deliverable as part of this grant application will be the update to the 2014 countywide bike ped plan. Uh, generally, from a long-range planning perspective, uh, from the day that a long a long-range plan is adopted, 10 years beyond that point is really that kind of that timeline where the community has to reevaluate that long-term plan and determine really the efficacy of that plan. Did the plan meet the goal that it was set out to achieve when uh, that community went through the planning process back then? So the purpose for updating the 2014 plan is going to be really threefold, generally speaking. One, to analyze which projects that were identified in the bike ped plan, which, ones, which projects have actually been fulfilled over the last 10 years. Second, uh, through newly available data, through public engagement, determine are there specific priorities that were outlined in the 2014 plan that are still priorities today? Uh, and conversely, are there new priorities that are not mentioned in the 2014 plan that based off of newly available data, public input, should be a priority today? Um, and again, this is going to be focusing less so on vehicular modes of transportation, again, more so on bike ped uh, modes of transportation. So the next slide, um, this is a third deliverable and one that I'm personally most excited about over uh, the next two, two and a half years is going to be <coughs> the uh, conducting demonstration activities to assist the planning process for these two aforementioned plans. So I think when we... Uh, all the alders here in the room, the mayor as well, I think you all have a rough idea, idea, idea as to a certain uh, intersection or street segment in your district that has an inherent safety risk for whatever reason, if it's visibility, uh, high traffic, uh, you name it. The goal of these demonstration activities is to recognize that there's a general theme that exists as to we want to make these identified uh, street intersections, these street segments more safe, but how to best achieve that safety goal is, is fluid. It's kind of ambiguous at this stage. There's a lot of, I'll give an example, during the Gurkee Park, Washington Elementary School area as part of the neighborhood planning process over the last year, one of the constant themes that we heard from residents was Green Avenue. Uh, right street segment between Main Street, Stanley Street. Um, there are a lot of comments raised from residents as to just the uh, safety concerns that exist. If it's uh, somebody wanting to walk their dog after work, if it's for a variety of different factors as to why, a safety, why some safety concerns exist. If it's excessive speeding, if it's that being ut utilized as a truck route. I think we all recognized through the planning process that the goal of the residents was to make that street segment more safe. What specific policy recommendations, street improvements that can be done to make that, inter make that street segment more safe we got a variety of different answers. So the goal of these demonstration activities is to pilot a variety of different uh, ro temporary road improvements and see which projects, work, which improvements work, which improvements do not work, uh, and which ultimately meet the goal of making that intersection, that street safety, or that, that street segment more safe. So the slide here just shows some written examples. I'll actually just jump to the next slide to give some more visuals. I'll stress. These are not, uh, it's not set in stone what activity, demonstration activities are going to occur, nor are there, nor are locations identified at this time. That's going to be the role of the private consultants, uh, consultant once it's identified, but some examples, temporary mini roundabout, chicane, uh, adding protected bike lanes and high visibility uh, painting on the roadway, using uh, speed bumps, say if there's a a speeding issue uh, nearby a local school, and using uh, more technological advances uh, that we've seen in the traffic safety world over the last 10, 15 years, try to bring that closer to home. So as I mentioned, this is the thing that I'm most excited about, honestly, because 
it's very minimal cost on our end, right? It's funded through uh, this grant, but the benefits for you all and for us as a city are going to be very, very beneficial to determine what is the exact type of improvement um, that should happen at an intersection. So when the time comes that intersection needs to be resurfaced, reconstructed in the next 5, 10, 15 years, you can look at that capital improvement plan and say, hey, based on this plan, we identified that uh, there should be some high visibility painting to try to make that crosswalk stand out a little bit more. Uh, Last thing I'll say uh, before kicking it back, if there's any questions, I want to give a I wanted to give a preliminary timeline. Um, roughly at this stage, there's a lot of work that's going to have to happen over the next few months. But roughly, we're thinking about July at this stage as to when a outside firm is collected through uh, selected through the RFP process and approved by the county board, uh, and that's going to be roughly where uh, we can begin the planning work. As far, since this is a countywide planning project, the planning structure, the uh, task force uh, steering committees, uh, that's going to be held on the county level to uh, focus on each of those three deliverables that I mentioned. So this will be my plug. If there's anybody who's watching this later on uh, who wants to participate in any one of these uh, uh, task force, these subgroups, to let me know, have a conversation with me. We can talk more in detail and we can see uh, if you're a good fit. So let, with that, uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take it. Otherwise, no, I, good news. And, and Adam, uh, typically on a presentation, because it's listed as a presentation, we don't do discussion. But if anybody has questions or comments, by all means, contact Adam's office and they can get a hold of you. How? Uh, call me, uh, area code 715-342-4158. Perfect. Or on the website too. Or on the website or email. Thank Check. you very much. Uh, yeah, this is this is actually going to be very helpful uh, in in the coming months because I know the co county has their uh, transportation safety commission uh, that I know you're getting get involved. Um, they yeah. meet quarterly yeah. to talk about areas throughout the county. Um, so when we identify problem areas, it'll be really helpful to have those those resources to try temporary fixes instead of, I think this might work, or I think that might work. Mm -hmm. uh, we can test them. Great. Thank you very much, Adam. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Moving on to item number six, our consent agenda. Um, is there anything anybody wants to pull or a motion? Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. Second by Bird. Discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Christensen. Aye. Shore. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Broderick. Aye. Burr? Aye. Plassans? Aye. Kneebone? Aye. Shuda? Aye. Lang? Aye. Fischler? Aye. Morrow? Aye. And that is approved. Item number seven is to request uh, to hire the engineer, city engineer at step five. I know there's some discussion on this at personnel. Uh, the director, human resources manager, and myself. Um, because it's an open position, we went ahead and posted it uh, in agreement by all three of us to kind of preserve the integrity of the process. The only thing you're considering tonight is hiring at step five uh, because we've had those challenges trying to get someone. So I would entertain a motion there. I'll make that motion. And seconded by Shore. Discussion? I got a quick question. Or yes, sir. Um, so this is posted out there at the step five pay right now? It is now. Before it's been approved by council? Yes. Is that right? No. <laughs> we we did that in anticipation because there was uh, pretty much all of the alders spoke. We did that in, in anticipation. We have yet to have an applicant, so if you chose to turn it down tonight, we could pull that listing tomorrow, or tonight actually. Okay, and then I got a comment with this because we spent 40 grand to get the pay structures for all the departments set up and then 10 grand bumping up on this. This is actually costing 50 grand. Um, and what was done and paid for is worthless. We, um, this could lead to other issues where someone else who feels that they're in a position that would be a tough spot to get someone to replace them to basically try to get a higher wage with us or anybody else coming in trying to get the higher wage. Um, I look at the 50,000 wasted and just keep that in consideration that whatever we're passing here, now all of a sudden that was passed by everybody a few months ago and now we're basically ignoring it. Uh, Thank you, I'm done. 
Okay, we'll go to Fischler and then uh, Shore, but I want to go on record first saying that I, I don't entirely agree with you and I will explain why after everybody's spoken. Um, I don't think it's a waste because um, as it was discussed in the, um, um, personnel. the personnel committee meeting was that we've spent over $300,000 already um, for just a couple of projects um, just subcontracting out the engineering. So I feel like hiring somebody at this rate would actually be saving the uh, city a lot of money. And then the other thing is that this is a highly specialized uh, position. So um, I don't know how many other um, positions that have like net new construction being one of the things that it's dependent on too, um, because we can't we can't raise the city levy unless we make net new construction numbers. And correct me if I'm wrong here, Mayor, but um, so I feel like that we didn't waste any money doing that study because a lot of these other jobs that it does cover weren't as specialized. Thank you. Alder Shore. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, un I understand the overall point about wanting to stick with um, a structure that we set up, but I, I don't think that um, that uh, veering from that uh, on a particular position necessarily means that it it's all to waste. And I also don't think that it means that um, you know it's open season for um, for going outside the plan. Um, as I said in committee last week, uh, you know, the the real point is to be in alignment with the market. That's what the survey did was to look at the labor market. Um, and the reason that there's for me anyway, a, a compelling reason to do this is that went out to the market and um, you know and didn't get a lot of applications and that was a signal from the market that that we needed to pay more and so I think um, it's important that, that we do this and get the position filled and um, and get the work done uh, as my colleague just said um, to rein in some of those contracting costs I think it's an important step thank you Alder Kimer. thank you um, I guess yeah just one one point of that wage study by Baker Tilly was to set the wages for dozens of jobs, not just this one. And I think what this does is it, it honors the, the pay range that that wage study set. So it set a range from low to high, and all we are doing here is honoring within that spectrum, that range place, having someone start at a slightly different spot um, because it is a highly skilled um, job, it, the pay is high. Um, one of the highest in the city. So I think it it seems dramatic in that sense, but we are honoring the wage study. We're honoring that pay scale. We're just starting in a different place than anticipated. So. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll I just want to say that I commend uh, us for, or the engineer and stuff to um, post the position. I think it's imperative that we did that. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. My two cents. Um, I, I think what this does is it actually preserves the integrity of that pay plan uh, by listing the job again at the higher wage. We are we are showing that we're sticking to the pay plan, and that certain positions may create a challenge at some point. The important thing to note here is that this is already in administrative policy. An internal group can pr approve uh, up to step three. And our policy has said for years that a step five can be requested and decided on by the council. Right. If the process is, if you don't agree with it, you vote no. Uh, but it's already in our process. So this is really preserving the integrity of that process. <coughs> um, my two cents. With that, we have a motion to approve and a second. If you're in favor, vote yes. If you are, po oh, I'm sorry, comments from the audience. Thank you for that. <laughs> Seeing and hearing none. If you're in favor, vote yes. Oppose no, and the clerk will call roll. Morrow. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Lang. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Plassans. No. 
Burr? Aye. Broderick? Aye. Keemer? Aye. Shore? Aye. Christensen? Aye. Thank you, and that is approved. At number eight is a resolution, a request from the city of Stevens Point to apply a permanent zoning designation of R3 single and two family residential for the property located at 5595 Regent Street with the parcel identified in your packet, consistent with chapter 23.01 sub 13 sub B sub eight. So moved. Motion by Morrow, seconded Second. by Nebone. Discussion. Yes, sir. I've got something with this one too. Um, so this property was purchased almost a year ago, and then it took up until a few months ago before it was annexed into the city. Um, or, or recently, I, uh, Director Kranowski, if you're in the overflow room, could you come here? Because I don't remember when it was annexed. I know that was the intention all of long, along, because that was the original purpose for purchasing this property. Yeah, I don't remember either. Good evening, and grab yourself a. How de Kale. So I'm sorry. I, uh, the question was, why did it take us uh, so several long. months to annex the property? Yes. There was no particular reason. Uh, we had originally thought about annexing uh, that parcel and then the parcels to the north um, that the city currently owns all in one uh, action. However, just with timing and with some other agreements that we had with the previous owners of the properties on the north, i.e., they could hunt through January, uh, it's illegal to hunt in the city. Um, so we did choose to just annex this property and prepare uh, the next annexation uh, probably in the, the coming months here. Uh, it did go on the market. We do have uh, one offer for certain. I believe we might be getting a second this evening and hopefully we can sign and get that sold um, for essentially what we've been asking for it. Since the property wasn't annexed, then the city spent $4,000 on property taxes last year paying on this property when they could have brought it into the city and paid little or none? Uh, no, so there was, uh, there's about, uh, we, we did pay, let me back up, the previous owner did pay a prorated rate for property taxes. Uh, and then we, because we're a non-taxable entity, we didn't have to pay property taxes, but the title company did prorate it. So the $4,500 was paid essentially through the title company when we acquired the property uh, earlier this, well, earlier last year. And I think January of 23 is when we acquired it. So when we purchase and we don't annex, we don't pay property taxes? Correct, we're a non-taxable entity. So if we bought property um, in the town of Hull and and uh, we kept in the town of Hall forever. We would not pay property tax. Fun fact, the town of Hall owns a fair amount of property in the city of Stevens Point. They don't pay property tax. Okay, thank fair you. Fair amount is pushing it. Yeah. They own some. A decent, <laughs> decent warehouse or two. All okay. right, that answers my question. Yep. Thanks. Great. Any other questions for the director as long as he's here? Thank you, director. Thank you. Take those uh, Brazilian <coughs> bread things into the overflow room and okay, finish them off. Um, any other comments or questions from anyone in the audience? Hearing and seeing none, if you're in favor, vote yes. Uh, opposed, no, and the clerk will call that roll. Christensen. Aye. Shore. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Broderick. Aye. Burr. Aye. Plassans. Yes. Kneebone. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Lang. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Morrow. Aye. And that's approved. Item number nine is a resolution request from Danielle Zellner, representing Valley Communities Credit Union for a sign variance to install a freestanding sign at the property located at 2940 Church Street with the parcel identified in your packet, consistent with chapter 25.14. You probably remember this from Plan Commission. And I would entertain a motion. Moved by Fischler. Second. Second by Burr. <laughs> Discussion. Comments from the audience? Seeing and hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Morrow? Aye. Fischler? Aye. Lang? Aye. Shuda? Aye. Kneebone? Aye. Plassance? Aye. Burr? Aye. Broderick? Aye. Keemer? Aye. Shore? Aye. Christensen? Aye. And that is approved. Item number 10 is an ordinance amendment. Uh, Aldermatic district boundaries, they were included in your packet. I do have a visual if anybody needs that. Um, and clerk, you enter, I will let you do the summary. Since uh, redistricting the boundaries of our districts were changed and then we added in a couple of annexation, um, that's the reason for the updated ordinance this evening. <clears throat> Older person Keemer. I, I will make a motion to approve and then I also have a question. I was ready to call you a second. Yeah. Seconded by Christensen. 
Uh, Alder Kimmer, you have the floor. Yeah, which, um, this is for Clerk Yenter and I guess the mayor, which, um, if any of the districts were changed by the annexations or were they? Uh, District 7 and District 11. District 7, okay, thanks. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions? Alder Christensen? So the only questions, the only additions were just the, the new annexed territories, everything else remained the same? Since redistricting. Since redistricting, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Just, I do want to reiterate uh, the fact that last year you did an outstanding job in the redistricting and, and clerk enter, well, a couple, yeah, that was, that was, a yeoman's job, and I know she put in a lot of extra time and effort, so this is just a slight alteration to a really well done plan. And if anybody wants to see the district maps, um, they're available on our website, or will be uh, the updated ones once this is approved by council. And I want to go on record one more time saying it's a lot easier doing it here than it was at the state level. <laughs> 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 Too soon? Sorry. Too soon. Too soon. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion or comments from the audience? Hearing none, clerk, please call that roll. Christensen. Aye. Shore. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Broderick. Aye. Burr. Aye. Plasance. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Lang. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Morrow. Aye. And that is approved. Item number 11 is an ordinance amendment regarding polling places. Um, and these are for the 1st and 10th District. Um, the 1st District will be at the uh, City Annex, which is the former Great Lakes Service Center, 1101 Center Point Drive. 10th District will be at the Stevens Point Water Department, 300 Bliss. Um, and that is because the um, uh, Ruth Guilfrey building is not available and being, bought, I don't know, remodeled maybe. I would make that motion. Moved by Christensen, seconded by Fischler. Discussion? Comments from the audience? I want to restate again, District 1 is going to be at the City Annex, which is the former stage store, Dunham's, uh, part of the mall. It was most recently the Great Lakes Service Center, 1101 Center Point Drive. And the 10th District will now be at the Stevens Point Water Department. That's 300 Bliss Avenue, and I say that because there's gonna be a, a, an election coming up very soon. I want people to know where they need to vote. If you're in favor, vote yes, oppose no, and the clerk will call that roll. Morrow. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry I, I had a quick question. Did I miss the comments? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I might have did it again. I'm That's sorry. okay, uh, just to verify, um, all of the all of the people who live in those districts will be notified by like a card from the city or? They, they were, postcards were sent to all the residents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Registered residents. I did get one, so. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good, good, good. Great to know. <laughs> I'm sorry, any other comments? If not, clerk, please call the roll. Morrow. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Lang. <clears throat> Aye. Shuda. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Plasance. Aye. Burr. Aye. Broderick. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Shore. Aye. Christensen. Aye. And that is approved. Item number 12 is uh, the 2024 Capital Operations and Maintenance Plan for Public Utilities. Uh, Director Lemke is joining us today remotely, feeling under the weather. So if anybody has questions for him, or I would entertain a motion. Oh, move to by Kneebone. Second. Seconded by Morrow. Discussion? Comments from the audience? Hearing and seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Christensen? Aye. Shore? Aye. Keemer? Aye. Broderick? Aye. Burr? Aye. Plasance? Aye. Kneebone? Aye. Shuda? Aye. Ling? Aye. Fischler? Aye. Morrow? Aye. And that's approved. Item number 13 is the 2024 Capital Operations and Maintenance Plan for the airport. Again, Director Lemke joins us remotely if you have questions. Otherwise, I'll entertain, entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve. approve. I'm sorry. Move by Burr, seconded by Kneebone. Discussion? Comments from the audience? Hearing and seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Morrow? Aye. Fischler? Aye. Lang? Aye. Shuda? Aye. Kneebone? Aye. Plasance? Aye. Burr? Aye. Broderick? Aye. Ke Keemer? Aye. <clears throat> Excuse me. Shore? Aye. Christensen? Aye. And that's approved. Item number 14, I'm going to ask uh, City Attorney Logan Beveridge to come on down. Um, and I'll start by saying we have it listed to go into closed session. If there are negotiations involved, we are allowed to do that. However, 
if we have a discussion only or a, a, an open session item and we need to go into closed session, we can't do it unless it's agended properly. If we choose to not go into open or closed session and we list it as a closed session, we can still do that and discuss that in open session. Uh, this is to talk about whether or not we want to provide water service to the village of Park Ridge and President Menzel's here. Um, and if we choose to, do we want to put some, some quid pro quo on there uh, or requirements? One of them might be an extended fire service contract because we'd be providing water um, and, and that sort of thing. But the reason we listed it as closed is because we, we, cannot, we can go into open if we list it as closed. But if we list it as open, we can't go into closed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then uh, Attorney Beveridge, I want to have you uh, talk about some of the finer points of what can and can't be done in closed and or open. So we've had a gazillion closed sessions over the years, and I usually don't really have anything to say about the decision itself to go into closed session because usually it's pretty straightforward. Like. We're looking at acquiring this piece of real estate. We need to talk about a negotiated position vis-a-vis -vis the you know private sector owner that we're going to buy it from. That sort of thing. Uh, here, it's a little different uh, because m there are many aspects of this decision and this discussion which are not negotiated. Uh, now, obviously, you know there's two parties. There's us in the town hall. There's a decision. Park Ridge. Or excuse me, <laughs> uh, Park Ridge. Just. Too used to saying town of fall. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, you know, there's two parties here, and there's a, there's a decision to be made. But uh, specific, and when I when I wrote an email about this to uh, staff last week about this agenda item, I said we need to be very mindful of the fact that should the council decide to go into closed session, the only things that can be discussed in closed session are the aspects of this that fit within the language that's printed there on the agenda item, namely negotiated matters, uh, bargained matters. Now, uh, the price you charge for water is not negotiated, it's not bargained, it's set via rules established by the Public Service Commission and all that, they'd pay the same rate for water that anybody else would. Um, the cost of the infrastructure to go in is pretty predictable. And um, I anticipate, I, obviously Joel can chime in on this, I anticipate that it would be, okay, uh, Village, you can pay for this stuff and then we can get connected to our system. <coughs> so it, it really does come down to this discussion of, you know, do we want to have some sort of contractual arrangement where there is uh, some type of this for that, um, you know, put forward by Village and what, what form that would take. So basically just saying, if you decide to go into closed session on this, just anticipate that within that closed session, it's going to be a fairly uh, constrained subset of the overall topic to discuss in that phase. And of course, you could come out of closed session to discuss the other things. Or you could uh, uh, just uh, not go into closed session at all and discuss all of it in open session. We're never compelled to go into closed session unless it's to talk about something that involves sort of like personal confidentiality, medical matters, that sort of thing. Thank you very much and stick around. So, um, a as the city attorney said, there uh, we can discuss anything in open session. But if we want to talk about things in closed session, we would need a motion and then do that. But there's two things that I think we want to talk about tonight. The first one should be whether or not we want to consider providing water service. We were in New Sewer, but providing water service to the village of Park Ridge. And if the answer is yes, we want to pursue that, is there anything we want to put as a condition of providing that service? An example that we talked about at staff, and again, I talked with President Menzel about this, is we currently have a short-term contract to provide fire service, among other things, and the chief is here to talk about that. The anticipation is that when this short-term contract expires, we'll have a five-year contract. However, if we put in water service, that would mean hydrants, do we want to seek a longer term contract because we're putting it in the infrastructure and at the end of five years, someone else, village A, could undercut us and use our infrastructure to provide fire service. Uh, that, that's just one of the, the options. The other one that people will tell you about, and I'm sure you've heard it from a few people already, is typically providing that water and sewer service has been our only carrot for annexation. With the village of Park Ridge, you can't require that, 
But to, if they chose to do it ever, they would first have to dissolve as a municipality, and then they could petition for annexation. We can't force annexation. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Attorney Beveridge, on that, but I believe that's what we talked about. But if there are other things that you want us to consider, if we choose to provide that or pursue providing that service and putting some conditions on the service, um, the conditions are something we could potentially talk about in closed session or open. We're not required to go into closed session. Um, obviously, I talked to President Menzel about the, the extended fire contract. Uh, that's, that's already out there. So the questions before you first, um, we hope to get some guidance on whether or not we want to consider providing it. And if we choose to pursue providing it, are there any conditions we want? But what we need to decide is, do you want to go into closed session to do that, knowing our restrictions? And we, we don't actually have it listed to come back into open session, so that could be problematic. Or do we just want to talk about it in an open session? I would recommend we talk about it in an open session. Everything's out of the table. Alder Shore, questions? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. A clarifying question. So uh, on the issue that you just mentioned of um, our paying to put in the hydrants and then another fire service could use them. So do we not have um, the willingness of the village of Park Ridge to bear the cost of the additional infrastructure? So for clarification, the infrastructure installation would be on the village of Park Ridge. Okay. That the, the users would pay for that. Okay. However, we, we put that in and it's our utility that it could potentially be used by another fire service um, when right now they don't have that. So, so it's more, is it more about the hydrants or more about the water? Uh, that's for you to decide. <laughs> I, no, I, I think they're, they're both, you know, they're they're both important things but to think about. They, but they pay, uh, Park Ridge pays for the pays to buy the hydrant. So, what would happen? And Joel, you'll need to chime in here. But Park Ridge pays yeah. for the infrastructure costs, including the fire hydrants. You and I pay a hydrant fee on our water bill. Um, so yes, they would bear the cost of all of the infrastructure service. But again, we're, we're doing this and another fire service could potentially come in and utilize that. Yes, the village is paying for it, but it's still our consent. Does that make sense? So if I could. Yeah, Joel, go ahead. And then we're gonna go to Alder Fischler. She's got a question as well. Okay. Um, the way to look at this to make it a little easier is probably to consider it something like a development inside the city. Anytime infrastructure goes in for the first time, the quote unquote developer pays for it. And then every single time it gets replaced after that, you know, every couple of generations, you know, we hope this stuff lasts for 100 years. Everything after that is on us. So if the village puts an in infrastructure, um, it'll have to be done to our specs, which they're aware. Um, and then it would have to be dedicated to the city. So it would be owned and operated by the utilities. And that's, that's not a problem because, you know, if a developer comes in, puts in a subdivision, they do it to our specs, they, they dedicate, dedicate it to us, and then we own and operate that in perpetuity. So this is kind of the same thing. One of the big things that I think is on the table here and needs to be considered is just that, you know, the village has got a lot of planning ahead of them. And so we need to state right now, okay, this is how we're going to work with you or not work with you. So this is really about getting some decisions out of the way that they need done so that they can do appropriate planning. Um, but the other thing there is that, you know, we've been working with them as the mayor referenced since 1945, I think on sewer. Um, there are several properties. Um, I think they all originally adjoined Main Street that are spelled out in ordinance as having the ability connect to, to connect to municipal water. And there's very few properties in the village left undeveloped. Um, so, you know, from, from our perspective, if you 
if you know if, if we're going to allow anything from a utility perspective you should allow all connections so for example uh, a few water mains running throughout the village in order to increase fire protection in other words if they ran east on one street north on another east on one street north on another type thing to to make more dense the availability of hydrants add eight ten hydrants throughout the village those mains are in there they're going to have to be dedicated to us because you can't connect to our system and then you operate it we're going to be operating it so if those mains at a very high cost of service or a high cost of installation aren't available for the residences that are adjacent to them to connect um, it's a very inefficient way to uh, construct public infrastructure um, so i guess i kind of feel like it, it should be something of an all or nothing because it's probably not affordable to do the in-between so mains for the sake of hydrants would hydrants would be very expensive mains for the sake of being able to allow residents to connect to them um, would make more sense um, all of it would be paid for of course by uh, the village and their residents and we would uh, take it over and own and operate it if that were to happen but whether or not it happens at all is is uh, a question to debate Thank you, Director Alder Fischler. Are, are we just talking about this in open session right now? <laughs> Until somebody chooses to go to open or close session. I mean, might yes. as well. I, yeah. I don't, do I have to make a movement to do that? or? Um, so, yes, but, but keep in mind the restrictions. I guess I have a question of how this all came about, Okay. if that could be explained, because I, I understand, like, I guess that would help me understand if we would need to go into closed session or not, like understanding the backstory to all of this. Okay, Joel or President If I Council? Yeah, if I could interject on that, I think that the closed session is probably appropriate for um, a time when we, we think that there's some things related to contract language to be debated. Right now, I'll tell you what I know of. We have our sewer service agreement, which I think has been largely unmodified for 80 years um just some small tweaks we have a water um hydrant uh, fire hydrant agreement that basically says this one fire hydrant is inside the limits of your village and we're going to allow you to use it and then there's the fire service one so there are those three contracts so if there's anything that you want to talk about t tonight that has to do with you know negotiation of those or Tying, um, timing of those to bring them in sync with each other, anything like that, then it's relevant. But there is a whole lot that we can discuss here in open session without really any harm at all. I mean, it's all it's all pretty straightforward stuff. And, and I would jump on that too to say, again, those two questions are, do we wanna pursue providing that water service? I think that's easily discussed and debated and voted on in open session. And two, if the answer is yes to that, do we want to put some conditions? Those conditions, generally speaking, could be, and this is all hypothetical, yes, we want to pursue providing water service, we want to see what that looks like, and we direct staff to negotiate um, an extended term on our fire contract, or that the village president must provide uh, pau de queo for uh, every meeting, uh, or, or uh, something along those lines. And that would avoid us going into closed session tonight as well. Then we would take this direction of staff, or, or I'm sorry, the direction of council, work it out with the village to come back and say, okay, here's what we're proposing. At that point, if you chose to go into closed session to give us more direction, more specific direction, that could be more appropriate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, um, before we go further, I want to give the chief an opportunity to talk, and, and Corey, I know you chimed in a little bit at staff, so if you want to say anything, that's uh, now would be the time. I think the three contracts that you got to be aware of from the fire aspect or fire and EMS side of the house is the one, the utilities contract that uh, Director Lemke has already talked about and the hydrant located in the village of Park Ridge. Uh, the second contract that we have is an EMS contract with the village of Park Ridge, which um, basically indicates that um, when we have a critical EMS call in the village of Park Ridge, 
besides sending, uh, normally in the county we would send an ambulance in car five, a field supervisor. We actually send a, uh, an engine or a truck company to assist that med unit in that area. Uh, the third contract that we have with the village of Park Ridge is the fire suppression contract. Um, all of these contracts expire uh, May of 2025, and we would be looking at then uh, President Menzel already knows, and, and we have been talking, um, that's why the fire suppression contract was only written for about two and a half years, is so that all of these contracts then would be up at the same time, and we could look at putting them all on uh, the five-year plans, which the other two contracts are on. But if you got, uh, if the uh, the alders of the city and, and the Common Council decide to do something different, they can do that. But those are the three contracts currently uh, that reside inside the fire and EMS world with the village of Park Ridge. And Corey or, or President Menzel, um, either one of you or both, take your turns, rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> Good evening, thanks for having me. Um, so a little background on this, the village has been an undertaking some uh, significant planning in the last couple of years, uh, strategic planning and our regular comp plan. <clears throat> and included in that has been um, identifying priorities and, and one of those has been uh, to start repairing some of the streets, start reconstructing streets. And then also about when that was happening, we also were, were uh, putting together the, the fire and EM an EMS uh, contract with the city. <clears throat> and so uh, in discussions while we were putting that contract together, we talked about what what uh, the fire department needed uh, to, to uh, maximize their service to the village. And one of the things that <clears throat> the chief mentioned was we need to add some hydrants. And actually the village has known that for quite a few years. So we've been wanting to do that for quite some time. And, um, and part of the understanding in, in setting up the initial contract, the three-year contract, was that the village would start looking at um, ways that we can add hydrants. And we already have a plan for what we what we'd like to see, uh, an ideal plan. And of course, um, most of this isn't gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take some time. It's gonna be very expensive. So um, we have a start right now. We've identified um, uh, three streets uh, with hydrants that would be along those, and that's part of our street reconstruction plan. And so, and that would include putting hydrants in. So that's, that's kind of a little bit of background on it, I think. I don't know if anybody has any questions on that or. Okay, any questions for President Menzel, Alder Fischler, go ahead. Um, so uh, just so I understand this clearly, um, so the town of Park Ridge doesn't have like uh, a crew to do this on their own and that's why they're asking the city of Stevens Point to do it? A that's crew to do? Or just the, the projects themselves. Uh, no, we would those? mean for the street reconstruction. Yeah, no, we'd be we have to go out for a bid on that. We have some um, grant applications out right now for those hoping to get as much as 50% uh, from state uh, DOT grants for the streets, and then that would be contracted out. And then as part of that process of reconstructing the street, since you have the street torn up, that's when that's when the uh, the water mains would get put in. So. So that's, that's what we have planned. Uh, of course, it's gonna be contingent on whether the, the council and the city wants, uh, you know, wants to do that with us. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for President Menzel? <coughs> we'll start with Alder Christensen and then go to Alder Keemer. So then kind of the important factor is you're looking at reconstructing streets and then that makes that the opportune time if you're going to bring in additional utilities and additional hydrants. It just makes sense to do that at the same time, just like when we do our street projects, that's when we update our utilities if needed and so you would take advantage of that timing and that's what makes this decision important at this point in time. Yep, absolutely. And, um, and the fact the streets we chose for the priority were uh, keeping in mind um, where it would be most advantageous to start putting in hydrants. hydrants. One of the streets is at the far southeast corner uh, of the village, and that is the weakest area for water supply. Uh, it's it's quite, quite far from the hydrant that's in the village, which is uh, right on Hillcrest, which is Jefferson Street extended. So we've actually chosen the, the street projects 
um, keeping in mind what what the hydrant uh, priorities would be. Thank you. And Alder Keemer. Thank you. Um, this is very basic. Uh, where and how do the village residents get their water now? Uh, the village is on uh, city sewer. Okay. But on uh, well well water. Okay. So they and each have their own septic systems, or no, there's a it's okay. on city city sewer. City sewer. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think uh, um, Director Lemke mentioned how the the sewer contract has been okay. around for decades. Yeah, 80s. 40s. Yeah. yeah. So so the so we've There's been still a well. Okay. And so the way that works is that uh, each city resident pays pays the city excuse me each village resident pays the city utilities for um, sewer usage based on uh, water that's used. in other words my my uh, well is metered. Okay. So how much water I used uh, dictates how much I pay for sewer. So and I need yeah I need to clarify that too because I know we're going to get questions. City taxpayers are not paying for the village of Park Ridge's sewer service. Right. Those are user based just like us. I don't pay for Mark's. Mark's doesn't Mark don't pay for doesn't right. pay for mine. Um, that's all fee based. It's not property taxes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I need to be clear on that because someone's going to bring it up. Yeah. Alder Plasance. Um, quick question. So are you going to be requiring the village residents to get off their wells and hook up to the city water? Um, that's something that we would we would need to talk about. We I think it's desirable that where there's water mains, we would at least want uh, laterals put in. And then, um, I, I, uh, again, we haven't talked about this in our, uh, in our trustees, with our trustees yet, but I, th I think... Uh, it would make sense that when uh, a resident's well is due to be replaced, that's probably when it would be economical for them to hook up to to a lateral. But you'd have you'd have to have the laterals there. Uh, so so that's one thing that we that we've been we haven't really determined yet, and it, it's something I've talked to Joel uh, about is um, when do we put those laterals in. Uh, are, are we better off putting them in right away, or do we just wait till uh, a resident wants to hook up? Our, my, our sense right now is it'd be better to put laterals in sooner rather than later. So, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for the president? Uh, Sam, uh, I was curious to what is a time frame that these agreements have been like. Historically, when we make these agreements, for what period of time do we normally make an agreement for? Uh, so this would be forever. If we decide to do this, the, the water service would be there in perpetuity. And as Director Lemke has explained, the initial cost would be borne solely by the village of Park Ridge. Any subsequent replacement would be spread out across the entire utility. So everybody that pays their utilities would pay the debt service on a reconstruction. Okay. Thank you. Can we discuss that? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. Go ahead, uh, discuss. Well, when, uh, when Director Lemke explained and sort of drew that analogy with a uh, private developer, it was both helpful and uh, got my attention um, because this is not a private developer. Um, and so uh, it did make me wonder about the possibility of um, maybe having having the village responsible for subsequent replacement as well. Joel, uh, I'm sorry, Director Lemke, I, would the Public Service Commission even allow that? Um, <clears throat> that's a really good question. The way that the water rates are calculated, um, what you collect uh, revenue on for paying for the replacement of infrastructure actually happens after the first time you replace it, right? So you you collect uh, fees on that uh, after you've borne the cost of replacing it. It's kind of funny. So um, I don't we don't have rates that are at all separated based on um, a separate responsible party. For infrastructure because of the fact that we produce and treat and distribute all the water in our system meaning we have responsibility from it uh, for it from the point of production at the well to the last flowing tap 
Um, so that's another reason why I think it's a, it's an inefficient model. If we were to say, go ahead and put the mains in and some hydrants and leave it at that, because then you have all that footage of water main, not bringing in revenue from customers along it uh, at some point, And then we'd have to replace it with no customers on it. So that'd be kind of tricky. And that cost truly would be borne by all of the ratepayers in the entire system. Now, if it's put in and there's, you know, relatively uh, dense development, as there is in Park Ridge, you know, I think the frontage in Park Ridge is probably pretty close to our average. You know, we've got some denser areas, we've got some less dense areas. Um, but I think that what it comes down to is that uh, that's probably pretty rep representative of an average. So the ratepayers that are uh, along that stretch of infrastructure that water main would be paying a pretty commensurate amount to what the residents of the city are paying uh the first time that we replace that stuff again 80 to 100 years from now i mean that that would be very good to know um i would have made a different guess um those seem like large lots over there but may, i might be losing sight obviously um, um, on the east side of town, particularly across green, those are uh, even larger. Um, but yes, if, if the um, Park Ridge average frontage was equal to ours, that works out. If it's significantly larger, you know, that, I think that does raise an issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, Comptroller, I'm going to give you the floor. It's, I, I know it's going to be a, a little off what we've been talking about, but I want you to give your opinion. Sure, just a, a couple of thoughts from my perspective. And I know people will ask, you know, why are we doing this for the Village of Park Ridge and why aren't we doing this for, say, other municipalities. I think one of the, the key points with the Village of Park Ridge is that we do have a very important business relationship with them in terms of the contract that we have for providing fire service. So that's really the difference with Park Ridge versus some other municipalities in Portage County as far as why we would want to do this for them and maybe not do it for some of the other municipalities. Uh, the other thing in talking with the, the chief, you know, I do understand that um, the way that our fire department is set up, it is set up primarily to deal with hydrants rather than, um, you know, servicing non hydranted areas with, say, a tanker truck. And, you know, that is one thing to note is that we currently don't have a large tanker truck to haul all kinds of water around. Um, and I know that we can call for mutual aid, but one of my biggest concerns is I don't want to see, you know, capital budgeting is hard enough as it is. So we don't want to see a request for a tanker truck in our capital budget. So certainly if, if we work with the village of Park Ridge on this, we work with them on the, the hydrants and get them kind of to where they need to be for the, the, the fire protection services so that basically they can sync well with our fire department. I think that that's just a win-win. I think it benefits both municipalities. Um, and I think that extending that fire contract then is important because I think that is one of the primary reasons why we'd be willing to do this for Park Ridge is because of that business relationship. So certainly securing a long-term co contract, I think, makes a lot of sense, especially since we do rely on that revenue now to fund a specific position uh, within the fire department. So those are just my thoughts. Any questions for the comptroller? trying to save you some steps all tomorrow um i think that we should offer it but i mean but again that you're the, the mayor's right they're going to pay they're going to pay for it and i know when we first moved to point we looked at a house in park in a park ridge and it was on well and we didn't want to well um and so we moved into the actual city and I, th and I think that will help out park ridge a lot because folks don't most folks i think assume that it's already on city water and we, and, and that's what we thought, until we got and and until we almost bought this house, and we found that it was on well and everything we had to do with that, and um, we just didn't want to really want to mess with that. Um, but I think if this, that if the residents of Park Ridge are going to pay f for this, and it's going to help them out as well, um, and for being on uh, and for being on water as well. Um, 
I think that it is to be. I think that it wouldn't be unfair to like ask for long for a long term deals, um, especially for fire, because um, I know because those roads the, those roads are used a lot with everybody going going into Iverson Park, and those roads are in horrible shape. Um, He's right there. I know, I know, but he but he also knows that as well. He knows that as well. And those are highly used roads. Yeah. I mean, everyone that's going there for sledding, everything that's going that's going down to the parks. So it's not like a normal residential street. It's used a lot. It's used a lot anyway. And if the residents of Park Ridge are willing to pay for it, I mean, I I mean, I I, I think I think it's a win-win. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for the comptroller before we let him go? <clears throat> okay. And I also saw the fire chief stand up again. Did you have anything to add, or you just you still here as a resource? And Logan, I know we're we're operating in that that area. I trust that you will interject if we do something that we shouldn't be doing. Alder Plasance. If this gets all set up and all the laterals are put in, and everybody from the village goes on the water system, do we have enough capable clean water for this? And if we run into a situation where we have to put in a new well, would that be just absorbed by the city of Stevens Point or the users in Park Ridge too? Director, I'll turn that over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, our current capacity is adequate for the number of residences that are in here and there isn't uh, enough commercial of any, you know, water consuming type that that is at all a concern um i will point out that the residences that are on odessa court and angelo court uh according to previous council action are already on sewer and water they would have been on sewer but they also have water and those are north of main street um and then a handful of others right along main street so this covers um a lot of stuff south of there and we already have a water main on sunset to hillcrest uh, which again, honestly, um, for for what it is, would be uh, recovering rates quicker if there were customers on it. So, um, yeah, in the future, when more capacity is needed, if this infrastructure was ours and there was customers along it, I think we would uh, equalize the the need for that over everybody because the 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 need is rising slowly over time. Uh, 2023 was a record bumping year for us, actually by just a hair, um, but we're handling it. We've got um, plenty of capacity now and, and certainly uh, an eye on what we need in the future. Okay, any other relevant questions? Otherwise, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and guide the discussion a little bit. Okay, so if there are no further questions, barring any objection from the city attorney, what I think I'd like to see is discussion on whether or not we wanna consider providing service. We're not saying yes or no, but do we want to consider it? If that vote after discussion is yes, then I would recommend that we talk about what, if any, conditions we want to put in. And I think I speak for the staff when we say, I think we'd recommend a longer term fire service contract, at least. Um, and if it's something that, uh, a condition that we think we need to go into closed session for, we can still do that. But I, I don't know that we need to get specific enough. I, I think if the answer is yes, and do we, we need a motion, it, Mayor? Pardon? Would we need a motion on this? Yes. Uh, yes, but it, once okay. I once I'm done, please. Okay. So the first thing would be whether or not we want to consider providing service. If the answer is no, we're done, <clears throat> and we go. If the answer is yes, then the next question would be what, if any, conditions do we want to put on it? And I really think it's at the stage where we can talk in generalities in open session. But if someone thinks that we need to go into closed session, you can certainly make that motion, discuss that, we'll call the roll, and enter into closed session if we need to. But I think we could probably just get a general direction from the council, let staff work out the details, bring it back next month or whatever um, with those details. So is that okay with everyone here? Yep. Mm -hmm. City Attorney, you're good with that? So then I would start with, do we want to consider providing water service to the village of Park Ridge and open the floor? I would make the motion that, that we do pursue an agreement with the uh, village of Park Ridge to provide them those services and would also, can, can we just combine both into one? If you 
Yeah, sure, you can. And and you know, I think my, I I sense we're in, in enough agreement just to um, approve the staff to work with the village to come up with the conditions to be approved by us at a subsequent meeting. So what is Good. the actual motion? So the motion, <laughs> it, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm paraphrasing, okay. is to pursue providing fire service to the village of Park Ridge and direct staff to negotiate or, or work out the conditions of providing such service. Is that correct? That. Water service. You no. said fire oh, water. I'm sorry, did I say something? You said, you said fire, fire service, service. Not Sorry, water. I'm, I'm sorry. I meant <laughs> water say. service. Yeah. Seconded by Fischler. Yep, and for the staff to be able to negotiate the conditions of Right, and that. bringing all of that yep. back at, at a future yes. date for council to consider, and then your board will have to consider it too in Park Ridge. So we have a motion and a second. Discussion on all of that. Uh, we'll start with Nibon, then go to Shuda. I think it's a great idea. I don't think you could find a, a better group of professionals than our fire department. Maybe our police department, but they're both right up there. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, way better know. than the other department. <laughs> we, we all know, He's we all right know that urban planning is very, very important. <laughs> <Funny>. <laughs> But I don't know that Park Ridge is going to contract with our community development department to do their urban planning. <laughs> but it, it seems to me it, it allows the residents of Park Ridge the opportunity to get on city water and have a, a, a good, um, reliable source of water. They don't have to worry about their wells getting contaminated or drying up or anything. Um, it, to me, it just seems like a, a, a win for, for for everybody. So I'm I'm supportive. Thank you, Alder Shuda. Um, I have a lot of friends in Park Ridge, um, but I do have some constituents that came to me today after seeing the agenda and said, the only reason I joined the city was so I could get water. Hmm. And I'll leave it at that. Fair enough. Alder Morrow. Um, I do think it's a good idea, but I was, if Joel could answer about how many households are we actually talking about that would be on this agreement. I think agreement. President Menzel would be better. It's about 250. 250 was the answer, about 250. Right. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, Alder Shore. Thank you. Seeing as we were talking about um, all of it, um, I, I have that one concern. This council has um, taken pains to uh, for uh, developments to make sure that we're keeping lot sizes uh, reasonable for the exact reason that uh, to have the tax base for infrastructure replacement down the line. Um, again, if, um, if Director Lemke's sense is accurate that there's, there's a close match um, between the frontage length of the average um, Park Ridge Village um, lot and ours, great. Um, you know, my concern is absolutely met. If, if they're significantly bigger, um, then, you know, I, I would have that concern about down the line infrastructure replacement cost. Okay. Is there a particular piece of data you would like staff to give you? Yeah, they can tell our, you the our, 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 our average frontage length okay. and the average frontage length, I guess for the 250 rather than everybody in the village. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and how and that, whether those are close. Okay, I would, I would submit um, that you wouldn't necessarily be comparing apples and oranges because my side of town are 50 foot lots. That's right. the oldest part of town. So right. you're gonna get a lot of 50 foot lots, right. but there's also lots that are the same or bigger for the, right. the village, I don't know that your average is gonna work out because we've got thousands of lots I will in the city. So I will trust that, okay. you know, decades down the line, <laughs> that um, because projects, replacement projects are done all over, you know, mm -hmm. the city, um, I understand that at different times, different places are getting worked on. Um, I'm comfortable that it all works out, understanding that and taking the average of everything in the city and just um, accepting that. Um, I would just like to know um, whether they're close because if, 
you know, the length is significantly larger, um, you know, for, for a, a property in uh, village, uh, in, in Park Ridge, um, not Village Park, not Park Village, um, that uh, then, then I think there would be kind of a, an equity concern. Yeah. And director, was that clear enough for you? Because you're the one going to be doing it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And just eyeballing things here, um, things to the west of Park Ridge, definitely uh, average smaller, for sure, like the mayor was saying. Um, what I would put the lots in Park Ridge roughly equal to, if you just want to kind of eyeball a subdivision, would be uh, east of Park Ridge. So stuff like Conifer 2, Hunter Oaks, Whitetail Subdivision, you know, those are the, the areas that are, you know, a little more in line with the sizes and frontages. Um, so yeah, we're definitely looking at stuff to the east side to compare to not not downtown. But, uh, why doesn't an average work? Because the comparable, if, if, the, if all- Oh, it does, no, all, I can certainly put that data payers, yeah. If all the rate payers in the city of Stevens Point are, spread, are spreading the shared cost of, you know, of any major infrastructure project in the city, um, then it seems like if we're concerned about fair share, that um, the comparable would be the entirety, the average for the entirety of the 250, and the entire, you know, and the average for the entirety of the city of Stevens Point. But, I mean, again, my, you know, yeah. I'm, the way I'm thinking about this is when we discuss uh, developments like across from the airport or across from the pumps, from the wells. Um, we have said we don't want, you know, acre lots, two acre lots, for the reason that we want the tax base to bear the, the infrastructure replacement cost down the line. I feel the same ab about this. I, I just want to know that um, we're not taking on um, properties where that cost is going to be higher than it would be over on our side because they have a significantly bigger frontage. Okay. And I, I think the director's got adequate guidance on, okay. on yeah. what you're seeking. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Director Lemke. But we'll get that information, he will get that information to us okay. at, at a later point. Appreciate Before we go further, Director Konowski stood up. That means he has something to say. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I just want to kind of, I, I see where the, the discussion's going and I think it's been really productive thus far. Um, my office does often get phone calls from residents in the city who don't have city sewer and water asking for detachment. Uh, and I do have some uh, reservation about uh, precedent setting, especially with our neighbors in the town hall where we're providing city sewer and water and we don't have the carrot uh, to annex into the city to you know, outward growth and additional growth within uh, our, our service areas as well. So I just, I want the council to be a little bit more cognizant that, I mean, there are, there are a number of residents in the city that are on city, um, are, that are not on city sewer and water, uh, especially Especially those in the Torrin Road area, uh, Hamilton Court, uh, a number of areas up by uh, Alder Shuda's uh, uh, home. Uh, and then we do have some folks um, off of Berlowski that are in the city but are not on city sewer and water that have asked for this. And uh, it's just not cost, uh, cost efficient for us to provide those services at this time. But um, being cognizant that, you know, I have a fear that we're setting precedent of providing uh, utilities to a, an entity outside of the city of Stevens Point. Um, you know, if the town hall came and said, uh, I think a, a lot about the properties um, east of Berlowski, north of Fleet Farm, uh, adjacent to some of the agricultural fields that run into significant nitrate problems in their wells, are we setting a precedent where we are now, because remember, likely this summer, we are running utilities up that general area for a city subdivision, are we going to be setting precedent for providing those sewer and, and water utilities to those without um, asking them to annex? So I do think there's some larger community development uh, discussion that could be had here. Uh, but I, you know, I have no general problem providing utilities. I just I want you folks to be thinking about some of the repercussions that might be coming. Thank you. Director, or I'm sorry, Alder Person Christensen, get a promotion. Right, or demotion, I'm not sure which that would be. Um, 
I think the one difference, though, is is the fact that we have had an agreement with them for 80 years on sewer. Um, this is just kind of completing the, the the utilities that have been in place for the better part of a century. Um, so they, they are kind of unique in all of that. It's a slightly different situation than those that have no utilities at all. They're on their own well and their own septic and are looking to have both brought out. This, this is kind of an anomaly and so I, I think you do have to differentiate there a little bit. So I don't see it as being precedent set, setting like maybe in other circumstances. And as far as the, the average frontage, I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're, we're comparing apples and oranges if we're, we're looking at all of them. I, I think we, could, we can get that average, but I, I would also like to see an average of the developments that have been brought online probably in the last 30, 30 years. I think that would be probably more analogous to, to what we're looking at in some ways because our new developments don't have, you're right, the, you know, a century ago there were 50 foot lots. There haven't been 50 foot lots for, for quite, and, and maybe should be again, but I think it's, I, that might be. This is the council that's been going for is. infill intensity. I, and I don't disagree with that, okay. but, but we're expecting I don't think we need to debate the merits right. of the right. request. So, the so I know. No, I, I don't let's, want let's the directors see. hearing this. <laughs> right. He can so provide the, it a couple of different ways. Right. He could get us the average for and then if somebody wants it up more a recent. different way. Yeah. That's the director. Because Joel's got a lot of that. extra time anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> <Okay>. uh, <laughs> so before we go back to Alder Plasance, anyone for the first time? Did we hit everybody? I think we got almost everybody. Okay, Alder Plasance. About 25 to 30 years ago, I lived in the village of Plover, and I was on a well at that point, and the village required everyone to hook up. At that point, from the water line into everybody's property, a lateral was run with a shutoff. Then it was the homeowner's responsibility from the shutoff to go into the house with the water. Is that different in Stevens Point? Nope. Mm -hmm. So really, this distance matter doesn't really matter because if the house is going to be set back further, it's going to be the cost of the homeowner. Yeah, and actually, the, the, the yeah, frontage the, from the, the edge of your property yeah. to get to to the middle. Oh, okay, it's okay. frontage; yeah. it's not depth. The laterals are actually the homeowner's responsibility yeah, right. as well. Right. Okay, I know because I just got a bill. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other thing that that may occur too, and I know when I was on city council up north, we did a, a major water and sewer project and and got a large rural development grant, and the offset about fifty percent of the cost of that project. We got five point six million dollars for that, um, but. In order to get that grant, the city had to agree to have everybody hook up to it whenever economically feasible. I think only one person was exempted because they were right by bedrock and would have had to bring in a, some huge contraption out of Iowa that was going to be incredibly expensive. But there are some grant requirements too that will require all, uh, when you do run water past, that they have to get hooked up. So. Yeah. When Plover did that, that may have come into play as well. Sure. Any additional comments? Any comments from the audience? I want to remind you that you are not making a final decision tonight. You are just authorizing staff to move forward. Correct. We still have plenty of time for input on every single level, um, including residents of the village of Park Ridge. And so contact your representative whomever that may be, um, and provide that feedback if you're watching at home or listening at a later date. And I'm gonna restate your motion, Alder Person, to correct me if I'm wrong, but we will be voting yes or no on providing or considering providing water service to the village of Park Ridge and authorizing staff to come forward with a recommendation regarding any conditions for providing such service. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Any further discussion there? If not, if you're in favor, vote yes. If you're opposed, vote no, and the clerk will call the roll. Christensen. Aye. Shore. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Broderick. Aye. Burr. Aye. Plasance. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Shuda. No. Lang. Aye. Bishler. Aye. Morrow. Aye. And by majority vote, that is approved. We'll have something back to you at a later date. Our agenda is exhausted, and we stand adjourned at 828. You know.
A video of this meeting is available for viewing on the city's website, stevenspoint.com videos.